Welcome to another episode of Tuesdays with Jakey. Uh, it is Tuesday, July 6th, 2021, and I am in the heartland of America, Macomb, Idaho, just back from yet another trip to the quaint, quiet, dirt road town of Yellow Pine, Idaho. Population 32 in the winter, or 23. People told me both. But uh, with a population that soars to over 100 uh, for the summer, 100 residents in the summer, and uh, boy, was it active this weekend for the 4th of July. I mean, if you're going to celebrate America, and, and you believe, as I do, that the heart and soul of America beats within its small towns, um, then what better place to go than Yellow Pine to visit and spend the 4th of July weekend and take part in the fantastic Yellow Pine fireworks display, which I bore witness to last night. And uh, boy, was, was it something. Uh, it actually was, was more than I would have expected for a town that size. And it was pretty cool. And uh, all the volunteer firefighters from the town were out on their little, uh, had like their little ATVs with huge like 10 gallon jugs of water with little like hoses attached to them in case anything went wrong or sideways. Because, um, if you know much about fireworks, typically the way things go wrong is they go sideways. Uh, if you're firing fireworks straight up into the air, they're usually going to be okay. But sometimes uh, uh, one of those mortar launchers will fall on its side and shoot a firework out sideways. And then it it gets shot into things that they weren't actually aiming for. And um, thankfully, things did not go sideways. Nothing went sideways down in Yellow Pine. Um, everybody got sideways. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute. But... Uh, First, let's take a break to have a message from our sponsor. Just kidding. It's too early. Um, I didn't make any notes this week. Um, last week, I had a lot of notes, and I had notes from reading that I had done, and I did a bunch more reading this week, but I just didn't make notes because most of what I read this week was uh, from a book in the library, and to be honest, I just didn't feel like it. That's really what it's all about because I did like fold over some pages, and I'll go back and make notes based on what I read, And uh, but not every week is going to be book club, though... I, uh, I've been thinking about introducing a book club angle to this podcast, and I actually, I'm going to do that right now, and uh, I'm going to suggest that everybody who feels like it reads Ishmael, um, a book by Daniel Quinn, and that's a book I really love, and uh, I didn't know I was going to do this today. I would kind of thought about it last week, so bear with me, but I think it'd be pretty cool if we, if we, uh, if, if we sort of all, whoever cares to, not all, you don't, there's no homework in this podcast, but uh, whoever cares to read something, I was thinking it'd be a cool thing to do. Maybe, I don't know what I'll do just yet. I was thinking of, I could do a whole podcast about a book I read, which, you know, I think that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I will do a podcast about the book that's solely about the book. Um, I might make it a bonus episode, so if you hadn't read the book, um, you don't care. I don't know. I know. We'll figure that out as we get closer. But let's say a month from now, uh, first week of August. I don't have my calendar open. I might as well do that, right? Um, say by Tuesday, August 2nd. Ah, oh, holy fuck. Okay, so Tuesday, August 2nd. Uh, Tuesday, August 3rd. The episode that comes out Tuesday, August 3rd, I will be talking about the book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And if you want to read it and, you, you, you know, you, it'll be helpful to follow along. Um, but the, the real, I think we should make it interactive, obviously. So I guess we'll do a Zoom meeting that I'll schedule after that episode. I'll probably have it by the time that episode comes out. I'll figure that angle out. And I'm going to I'm I'll mention it all month. Um, but then we can have a Zoom meeting where everybody gets to kind of see and talk to each other if they feel like it. Yeah, it could be an experiment. It could be three of us on there. But uh, we can all chat about the same book. Uh, let's see if that works, you know? Light summer reading with Ishmael. Ishmael's a book that sort of, you know, Sapiens was a book that was talked about a lot in the past bunch of years, right, by Yuval Noah. Um, and that was a book kind of, kind of about the history of humanity. And it was like 5,000 pages long, I think 5,200 pages long. And most people I know who try to read it have not been able to make it through. I, I haven't either. I probably, probably bought three copies of it over the last 10 years or eight years or whatever since it came out. I would try to read it, but it's like, man, books can't be that long if you really want people to read them. So 
my boy Eddie Eyeball sent me a few different, a couple of different summaries that he found on the internet, and I read those, and those are cool. But what I'm getting at is that's way too long and involved, and like, who's got the fucking time? You know, can't we? Can't you? Uh, can't you? Compact humanity, the history of humanity, down into a more uh, readable chunk. So that's kind of what Daniel Quinn did. That he wrote a book called Ishmael that was put out in the early to mid nineties, ninety three, ninety four, maybe. And uh, Larry Block, founder of Wetlands, turned me on to it, and I read it not long after I started working for him at Wetlands. And then I read it again, and I read it again, and I've bought. I don't know, 20, 30 copies over the years, maybe more, giving them out to friends. I've reread it myself. Uh, It turned out to be a little bit of a series, but it's the story of human civilization as told by an ape who communicates with his pupil. The ape is a teacher, and he communicates with his pupil kind of telepathically. Um, The guy, the ape, takes out a ad in the local newspaper that says, Teacher Seeking Pupil, and says to go to an address. And um, I'm not really giving away any spoilers. All this stuff happens within the first, like, ten pages. But he takes out an ad, says, Teacher Looking for Pupil. The guy shows up. It's like a kind of off an office suite in a sort of nondescript rundown building on the on the edge of the downtown area of, a, of whatever city they're in. I don't think they ever say what city it is, just could be any American city and guy goes into this office and on the other side of a pane of glass is an ape and the ape just starts talking to him telepathically and they he just keeps going back week after week meeting after meeting and the ape explains the whole history of civilization and humanity and book's only like 200 pages or so it's not super long but it's super touching and intense and it brings up a lot of different ideas so the we I mean, give everyone plenty of time to get a copy It'll be Tuesday, August 3rd. We'll talk about it. That's Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Not my Ishmael, which is one of the follow-up books. And then he's got something called Beyond Civilization. Uh, But Ishmael, the original by Daniel Quinn. You find that at uh, fine independent booksellers anywhere. It's a a book that's very popular, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. Um, I'd advise against buying it on Amazon.com if you can. Um, Thrift Books is a good resource for cheap books uh ebay has books that are used books that are are cheap and quickly delivered often like you know where to get books what the fuck am i doing i I don't have to tell you where to get a book or who to buy it from like buy it from amazon if you want you know i'm not your fucking dad i'm not your uh i'm uh you know i'm not your i'm not here to scold you if you want to give money to jeff bezos but if you if you're the type of person who enjoys giving money to jeff bezos i would assume that you're not the kind of person who's enjoying this podcast on a regular basis but you know maybe you are and it takes all types and uh, all types is what i encountered this weekend up in yellow pine so i've gone on and on i have pined over yellow pine many times on this podcast and uh it's this when I got here last year, I read about a harmonica festival that happened every year where it's just harmonica music. And it was in a town called Yellow Pine. And last year it was canceled and uh, because of COVID. Can you imagine a harmonica festival in the time of COVID where the whole point, like playing the harmonica, is like you got to blow really hard through this weird little metal and plastic thing and then it shoots spittle and sound out the other side i guess like that's pretty much what every horn is right like i wouldn't have gone to a brass band show in a closed area in new orleans right um during covid but uh even even in the uh sort of uh what 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 people perceive to be super right wing capital of america idaho uh i don't think it's as right wing as everybody says though though some parts of it are super right wing obviously but so are some parts of manhattan man and i think that's what the that's what the last year and a half or five years has really showed us that there's right wing nut jobs everywhere and there's left wing nut jobs everywhere and like everyone's a nut job but uh i keep finding more and more cool people in idaho and um Yeah, I I don't think it's as right wing as people think, though. You know, when I first got here, I was having that issue because you see a lot of Trump flags everywhere and you equate that with right wing um, or just I don't even want to say stupidity. That's wrong. Like misinformedness like and 
you know, I don't know what it is. I've talked about it here before, and I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure what it is that makes someone think that Donald Trump is uh, any sort of a good human being, you know? Um, he's just, like, completely full of shit. Whether or not he's a good politician, maybe, maybe he was. I don't, I don't really know enough about politics to say if he was good at it. He didn't seem to be, but uh, he's certainly not a good human being, right? Multiple divorces, fucking kids he doesn't talk to, other kids that he sexually objectifies. Uh, just literally in, incomprehensible. No, what? what uh, in whatever the word is, he's, he, he lacks the ability to tell the truth, which is shocking. But anyway, there's a lot of Trump flags out here in Idaho, but uh, I, I would also venture to guess that there's a lot of Trump flags because Democrats who've been in power over the years haven't done much to make people's lives in Idaho much better. But I'm not going to get too deep into politics. But Yellow Pine, what a cast of characters. So I found out about Yellow Pine from the Harmonica Fest, and then all it, because it wasn't happening last year, I was like, I'm not gonna ride there because it's it's fucking far away, man. It's except it's not far away. It's just this way, just over the hill. Um, it's 27 miles as the crow flies. 77 miles if I want to take the route that's mostly paved. 52 miles if I want to take the all dirt road that gets there. And uh, either way, it takes about three hours. I can do it on. Google says three hours and 15 minutes for one route, three hours and a half for the other route. I've found out over the last two weekends that I can get from my house here in Macomb to downtown Yellow Pine, which is, uh, there's only one street. So just to the heart of Yellow Pine, right to the Yellow Pine Tavern. I can get my motorcycle to be positioned between the Yellow Pine Tavern and the Yellow Pine General Store in about two hours. Um, by taking that 52 mile dirt road and so I went up there once and I did a whole loop in one day and I rode down to Cascade and out past Warm Lake and up a 26 mile dirt road and it got me in a yellow pine and then I came back down Lick Creek Road which is the dirt road that ends up coming right into the edge of town of McCall and the next time so I liked it so much. I just went up there. I stopped in the Yellow Pine Tavern to have lunch. I met the owner. was chatting with her. was asking her a lot of questions about this town. Enough that I, I arose suspicion from her, uh, so to speak. And I just kept asking, what, what is this town? Like, how, who lives here? How do people survive here? Um, turns out they're mostly retired or they're like summer homes. But these are not the kind of summer homes you would imagine. These aren't like there's no lake um it's not a summer home destination and and in fact there's the whole thing about yellow pine is that it's located deep in the heart of the payette national forest and it's just a small area of land um it's like i think i think it's at one mile by one mile like one square mile of land that's the town and the rest of it as soon as you get out of that town and then it's uh then it's just national forest land so there's no houses on the way there you know, nearby, there's just this cute little downtown area, and then you got to go pretty far out of that to find any privately owned land. So what I've learned is that it's pretty, it's like a closed community, and that most housing or land lots, of which there are a few that are unbuilt, um, aren't even put up for sale to people from outside the community, because they want to keep it kind of insulated. And not in a weird way, not in like, there's no inbreeding or anything like that. Um, but they just want to have their nice, quiet little mountain community. And it's fucking quiet, man. Like, there's not much up there. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like three hours to Cascade, Idaho, which is not a nice place. And it's not, they have a supermarket there called D9, which is somewhere between a bodega and a sea town or a key food. Like, it's not a nice supermarket. To go to a nice supermarket, you're, you'd have to go three and a half hours to McCall to go to Albertsons, or you'd have to go like four and a half hours, four and a half or five hours to Boise to go to like a Trader Joe's. So, I mean, that town is out there, you know what I mean? And they want to keep it that way, and I can dig that. But I went up there, and I was like, this place is cool. And then I saw a poster for two weeks later. They were doing the Bald Mountain Knuckle Dragger Strongman Contest. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to find a place to camp. As I've said on this podcast before, there's campsites that are official campsites. And anywhere you feel like camping in a national forest land, you can camp for the most part. You just have to be a little bit away from a water source and a little bit away from a road. 
um, and you can camp wherever you want. First time I went up, I found a full-on primitive campsite. This time I went back and I used a National Forest Service campsite, which usually the, the, the Forest Service campsites or, or park state park campsites will have a, they'll have a fire ring and a picnic table and um, kind of a, like a parking spot for you to pull your car into and sort of a designated area that's that campsite. And they usually have... Uh, some sort of pit toilet and a lot of times they'll have a campsite host who will like sell you firewood and clean water these these are free campsites the ones i found this weekend they're run by the national park they do have there was two pit toilets along the route of 10 campsites and a sort of very primitive fire ring that was just kind of like corrugated metal formed in a ring and that like kind of tells you where to have the fire but nothing else or no picnic tables no chairs nothing and they're free so i was like Damn, I love it. I was in campsite number six, which I like, but did not have quite enough shade in the morning. I had to, like, really move my chair around and, and dance my chair around the shadows cast by the sun, cast by these tall yellow pines, so that I could uh, be in the shade, because the sun up here is fucking hot. And if you're watching this on video, you see I'm kind of nestled against my cabin here because I'm trying to be in the shade. Last week, I was too hot. I was sweating a lot. I was out in the sun recording the podcast, and... To be honest, I rode back that dirt road today, this morning, uh, from Yellow Pine, and I just didn't feel like lugging my shit down into the woods to set up somewhere in the shade. So, yeah, it's hot. So, I think next week, if I go back, I'm going to look for campsite three or four, which seem to have a lot more shade, but also right along the creek, which is where I bathed all weekend, which was great. But, um, so I went up that, that second weekend, I went up for the Bald Mountain Knuckle Dragger Contest, and it was like a strongman Scottish Highland Games type of strongman contest, and uh, that was on Saturday, so I got up there Friday morning, I hung out all day, went to the tavern for lunch, talked to Lorin, the owner, um, then went back on Saturday to watch the Knuckle Dragon competition, I only stayed like a mile outside of the town in the forest, um, so when I say went back to the town, it wasn't going that far. In uh, yeah, second day I met Josh, the guy who owns the general store in town. He just bought it recently after it was closed for four years. So for four years, there was nowhere to even buy anything in the town except the Yellow Pine Tavern. And um, there's another restaurant up there too called The Corner. On the corner or The Corner? I don't know. Huge Trump flags outside, so I haven't been in. Um, but uh. Yeah, so I met Josh, started chatting with him. I met another local guy who I just found out this past weekend. His name is Paco. I think it's Jeff or John or something, but he's like, everybody calls me Paco. And I was like, I get down with that, Paco. And uh, yeah, so, so what I didn't say, I, I try to be as truthful as possible in this podcast and not hide anything. That's kind of the point. Um, I mean, if I'm going to talk about it at all, obviously, because there's things I'm not going to talk about here on here at all. Just because, you know, it's uh, goes back to that old phrase, that old chestnut was like, just because I give some insight into my life doesn't mean you have access to all of it or something like that. Um, but it's like, yeah, so everything I choose to talk about on here, I want to be honest about. And I wasn't fully honest about why I went to Yellow Pine last weekend. And I had liked it so much the first time I went that I was like, I'm going to go back there and I'm going to get myself a job at the Yellow Pine Tavern. And I had only talked to, I had only eaten lunch there. I had a burger and then I sat on the couch and sort of read a book for a couple of hours and watched people come in and out and uh, just kind of eavesdropped on conversations. Yeah, eavesdrop, I mean, it's not a big place. So people were talking to each other and... I was just like, this place is kind of cool. So that the reason I went back was sort of to go to the strongman contest, but also I had up my head. I was like, I'm gonna, f I, I want to spend more time up in this town, and I'm gonna find a way to see if I can do some work up there. So when I went back the second week, I was like, kind of spying it out, seeing what was going on over the course of the weekend, asking some more questions, and um, you know, I, I said at one point to Loren on Saturday, I was like, do you run this entire place by yourself? I noticed she had had like, like some helpers would come by for like a half an hour here, half an hour there. And I asked one of them, do you work here? She's like, no, I just, I live in town. I help out when, well, if Loren's busy, I'll just jump behind the bar if she's cooking food or whatever. But it seemed pretty much Loren ran the place herself. So, uh, 
after like three days, though, I was like, she's not going to hire anyone. I just got the sense that this is Lorin's place and Lorin does all the work around here and she doesn't want to hire anybody. But on that Sunday, the third day I was in Yellow Pine, I went back for breakfast and then uh, I had asked her if I could fill my water bottles, which I had done previously during the weekend to get clean water. And um, I just said... You know, I was kind of waiting for the right time, too, because I didn't want to make an offer like that with other people around. And uh, I waited for the right moment, and I was getting ready to leave. And she's like, oh, so you headed back to McCall now? And Lorraine's probably, I would assume she's in her 60s. Um, I mean, I think that's a safe assumption. She has kids that are 40 and 38. So, you know, early, mid-60s, I would guess. Um, Cool-ass lady, though. Funny as fuck. Um, And... But I said to her, I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to head back to McCall. I was like, you know, do you, uh, do you ever like need any help around here? Would you want like, you know, I would, I would be honored to like work here. And she was like, what? Really? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, but you live in McCall. And I was like, if, if we could work it out where I could work consecutive days, I'd ride up here and camp and like, I don't know, just pitch in, do whatever you need. And she was like, can you tend bar? <laughs> I was like, well, you, you don't have a liquor license. You know, which we had discussed the day before. It cost thirty thousand dollars for her to get a liquor license. So this beer and wine. And I was like, I didn't say I didn't say this in that moment, but I was like, well, you know, all you sell is canned beer and boxed wine. So I was like, yeah, of course I can bartend. And she was like, can you cook? <laughs> I was like, well, you know, again, the menu is a frozen pizza from the supermarket, cheeseburger, grilled cheese, quesadilla, BLT, and fajita. So I was like, yeah, I can cook everything you have on your menu. I was like, you might need to show me like the way you like it done, but yeah, I can do that. And she was like, oh, okay. Well, I've had bartenders in the past who refuse to cook anything but pizza because they can just stick that in the oven. They don't want to deal with anything. And I was like, yeah, how, how hard could it be? What's the worst that could happen? Give someone salmonella? Maybe. Um, so I was like, you know what? Like, here's my number. Give me, if, if you're interested, give me a call because I don't want to put her on the spot, you know? I didn't want to be like, you got to hire me right now. And uh, And she was like, Okay, yeah, I'll give you a call. Well, that's cool. And then Sally came around the corner, who had been in there helping out for a little while during the day. Sally had told me her whole story about how she um, had grown up visiting Yellow Pine. Um, like her parents lived in another part of Idaho, but they had a cabin up there. And people just go up there for like hunting and fishing, not even really hiking. There's not even really that much hiking trails around there. It's mostly hunting and fishing and panning for gold. And... Um, it's just kind of a place to go to really, like, get away from it all. It's not a resort, right? It's not a destination. That's what I like. Um, like, McCall is kind of like a destination, and people come in from all over. And it's like, no thank you. You know what I mean? Like, I did, like on the way ride back into town today in a McCall, I made sure I took some extra back roads so that I wouldn't have to go through the town at all. Cause it's like, ah, oh, it's fucking holiday weekend. It's going to be a zoo. And it's all relative, coming from Manhattan, of course, um, but still, like, I'm lucky enough to now live, like, up on the side of a mountain outside of McCall, 10, 12 miles outside of McCall, and I like it that way. Like, I don't want to live in a town, and I don't want to be in a busy place. Um, I don't want to wait in line for anything, uh, anything at all, really. I never did enjoy waiting in line, and I think as a New Yorker, as a good New Yorker, you figure out how to avoid waiting in lines and still get the things you want, and that's that's one of the top tricks and secrets to be a New Yorker. If someone tells me they waited in line for 45 minutes at this new pizza place and they're a New Yorker, I automatically know they're a fucking idiot. It's like, you walk by that place multiple times, you scope it out, you find out when the lines are longest, when they're the shortest, and like, I, there was a place, Prince Street Pizza, near my house in Soho that I loved, and... Well, before I moved away to London, no one went there. When I moved back from London, it was mobbed all the time, crazy lines down the block. And then I just learned, like, the, you learn, like, usually if you show up there, they close at 11. You show up there at 10 minutes to 11 on a weeknight, not going to be any line. So if you want Prince Street Pizza, don't fucking go at noon. What are you, an idiot? Um, one time, though, one time I was, like, really craving it, and I went by, and there was a line of, like, 10 people, which is very short line for them there. So what I did was... I got in line, I got went to get a slice, and when I turned around, when I looked, there were, the line had ballooned to like 50, 60 people. So I got two slices. Their pepperoni square pie was like the, the thing to get there. And I bought two, and I ate one, and then I walked to the people in the back of the line, 
the very last people in line, boyfriend, girlfriend, I was like, hey, I just bought an extra. It was in a bag, all bagged up. And I was like, I bought an extra just for you guys. Like, there's a long ass line. So I don't know if this is what you want. Probably, right? The pepperoni slice. They were like, yeah. And I was like, here, welcome to New York, you know? And they were like, what? And I was like, you're visiting from out of town, right? They're like, how'd you know? I was like, because you're waiting in line for fucking Prince Street Pizza. That's how I knew you weren't a fucking New Yorker. If you told me you were from town, I would have snatched it right back out of your hands and give it to the next tourist I found. But, uh, yeah, I just, so, yeah, I just not, I'm, I'm looking for the next place. Like, I like McCall a lot, but I'm not sure this is where I want to live permanently. Uh, but I'm kind of getting the vibe that I want to live permanently in a place that's more like yellow pine. So for a couple of reasons, I was like, I'm going to find out some more about yellow pine. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to give myself a chance to spend some time up there. And I got to tell you, most people who live in McCall that I've talked to, like they never been to yellow pine. They've heard of it and they know that there's nothing up there and that keeps them from even going to visit. And if they knew about it, they would understand that the road, that 52 mile dirt road from Lick Creek to Yellow Pine is one of the most gorgeous roads I've ever ridden a motorcycle on or driven a car on. And I've driven most of the gorgeous roads in America. I'm not, that it's not hyperbole. I'm not, I'm not saying that to make myself look cool. I specifically buy maps that are highlighted to be the coolest roads to ride motorcycles on, which is also the coolest roads to drive cars on, obviously. Uh, and I've ridden almost all of them. And I got to say, this is one of the most beautiful I've ever ridden. So it's like multifold purpose. It's like, I want to spend more time in a town like that, see what it's really like. Like that's the closest town, closest I've ever come to finding out what Sicily, Alaska from, from the TV show, uh, Northern Exposure, what that's really like. So I, uh, I want to spend more time there. I want to, I'm curious about possibly moving there, which sounds crazy, but I want to move there. And I learned I also learned from last weekend's visit there, too, before I had asked for the job. And I kind of knew this, but I figured this out, was that, like, when parcels of land or cabins come up for sale that are up there, they don't put them on the market, typically. They offer them for sale to friends or family members. And I kind of learned enough about that the first week. So I was like, you know what? Before I even went on up there last week, I talked to my friends up here, Greg and Shanti, and I told them what I was doing. I was like, I'm gonna go up there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Lauren if she needs help. I'm gonna try to get a job. I'm gonna try to work there all summer. Then next year, after next year's cruise season, when I have some money built back up, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go spend some more time up there, and I'm gonna put the word out that I'm looking to live there. If this is all pie in the sky, right? Because I hadn't even been up there, but I was like, that's my sort of plan, and I formulate plans a lot in my head, and some I see through. And some I abandon halfway through or just very short into because that's what you do. You make a lot of different plans and you have a lot of balls in motion. You're juggling a lot of different things. And that's how you end up doing cool shit in life. Um, And that's one of those things, too. People have always said to me, like, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. My whole life, people like, you're so lucky you get to do that or do this or that you got to do that. And it's like, motherfucker, luck doesn't really have anything to do with it. And what what do they say they, they say is like... Luck is when hard work meets preparation. And, like, it may seem lucky, but, like, I fucking have conversations with everybody wherever I go. I'm inquisitive. I ask questions. I talk to people. And that's how you end up meeting people that get you into cool different situations, right? You don't, you can't, life won't wait, man. You can't wait for life to come to you and to give you experiences. You got to be out there grabbing life by the balls all the time. So this was one of the things I decided I was going to do. And I wasn't like... I want to move to Yellow Pine. Maybe someday I'll meet someone in Yellow Pine. I was like, I'm going to fucking ride back up to Yellow Pine. I'm going to ask a bunch more questions and I'm going to see about getting a job. I'd also thought maybe I'll ask Josh, the guy about the general store. Maybe he needs help. Maybe Loren would want help one day a week. Maybe Josh would want help one day a week and I could tie them together. I didn't know what was going to happen. But uh, I told Greg and Shanti that I was going to head up there. And I was like, I'm going to spend three nights there and I'm going to figure out what's going on. I'm going to learn a little about the town. And if I still like it after asking a lot of questions, I'm going to see if I can find a job. So I asked Lorraine if she ever wanted help. And she seemed a little surprised. (laughs) And uh, she ended up, I gave her my phone number and she called me a couple of days later. And she left me a voicemail and it was something along the lines of, uh... So, hey, Jake, this is Loren from Yellow Pine Tavern. Uh, do, do, do you really want to work here? Um, if so, uh, give me a call back. Uh, okay. So I called back, and I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I'd love to. And she was like, how about Thursday, Friday, Saturday? And I was like, 
well, I got something going on Friday this week, but Saturday's the 4th of July, Sunday's the 5th, right? Or Saturday's the 3rd, Sunday's the 4th, Monday is the 5th, which is a holiday. So like, I was like, I can come up this week on Saturday and Sunday. Let's see how it goes. And we'll just do that as a first step. You can show me the ropes. And then if I do well, we'll talk about when I can come back. And she was like, all right. And I got up there and uh, I didn't call her again. I didn't text her. Um, I'm not even sure that, like, I'm, I don't know that she texts. Um, I did notice that she had a flip phone of some sort. So I was sure she didn't want to carry on a full length text conversation. I don't know, maybe she would. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, I thought about calling her Saturday morning to let her know I'm on my way. And I was like, I told her I'd be there at two o'clock on Saturday. So I left here at like 1030, got into like the campsite area that I had I found uh, at 1230, set up my tent and all that and um, got shit prepped so that when I came back from a long night of work, I'd be able to go to sleep, hook I set up my hammock, set up my little camping stove, and then I showed up at like, I don't know, 135, 140, somewhere in between there. I, I think it was like 137, 138, but I don't want to like sound like I paid too much attention to that kind of stuff. But yeah, I got there about 138 um, on Saturday, and I walked in, and she was like, oh, hey, Jake, what's happening? And I was like, hey, what's up, Lauren? I was like, you ready to put me to work? And she started showing me how the cash register worked, and, uh, you know, when she called me and we talked about it on the phone, I didn't ask her what it paid and she didn't tell me. And honestly, I didn't care. And uh, 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 it turns out I just work for tips. <laughs> so it doesn't really pay, but also maybe a, a cut, she said, if, if, of sales if they hit a certain goal um, at the end of the month. So I'll find out at the end of the month what happens there. But I was like, I don't, I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? I'm just like, really, I'm here for a long term. And, I, you know, obviously I want to get paid. And I ended up doing okay on tips on Saturday and less okay yesterday, Sunday. Um, it's Monday now as I record this. And um, But it was like definitely worth my while, I would say, for going up there. And I met the kookiest cast of characters, as you can imagine, who I don't even have everybody's names right. But uh, it's like a mixture of old cowboys, ranch hands. I think a couple of people who seem to be sort of well-to-do. Um, I'm still working on getting everybody's stories. The one who most stood out is Mushroom Steve. Mushroom Steve showed up with a whole, like, like a... Yo, what are those things, those plastic things that you see dishes in in the back of the restaurants that they push through the dishwasher? So it's not kind of like a milk crate, but a really wide but short milk crate type of thing. He had one of those filled with morel mushrooms, which morels are this weird species of mushrooms that can't be cultivated. They grow in Idaho and some other places, I would assume, but only during certain times. The conditions have to be exactly right, certain time of the year, and I guess they're incredibly tasteful, tasty, and... um so Steve came in, walked in, dude was like, yo, dude had some ragged ass pants on, um, tank top shirt, body kind of like Iggy Pop, and just covered in fucking dirt, dirt, ugh, dirt and soot and shit, and dude looked like he had just like, just like breathed on the devil's asshole, and then got farted against or something. He was a mess, and... He was trying to sell these mushrooms, and then there was a group, there was a group visiting from Texas, Houston, and I was chatting up, chatting them. Uh, the whole business of the bar, the the tavern, is that like a lot of people make day trips up to Yellow Pine. Like, ah, oh, they've heard they they're, they came to Idaho. They're fishing down in Warm Lake or Cascade, and they've heard Yellow Pine's cool. Hey, let's drive up there, take this cool dirt road, have lunch. Uh, not a lot of people stay there because there's not really a lot of places to stay. There's some really primitive cabins and the general store has two motel rooms that I think, yeah, each have a shower, he told me. But, like, there's no hotel or anything like that. Uh, there's a place called Yellow Pine Lodge, but they just have some primitive cabins, like, and a shower room. Like, no electricity. Uh, they charge $60 for those. Um, but, like, yeah, there's nobody, there's no, like, scene of people staying up there. So people come up, do some camping, come into town, get a couple beers, some food, whatever. And um, so this group from Texas was like, hey, do you, do you have a paper bag? And I was like, I don't know. Let me go look in the back. And I didn't think to ask what it was for. And by the time I found a paper bag and came back out, a local had bought all 20 pounds of 
morel mushrooms from Mushroom Steve, and apparently they're pretty expensive. They sell for like $25 a pound. So she had fucking put out a lot of money, a lot of cash. And I came back, and in the span of like two minutes, it took me to find this paper bag. When I got back there, like someone just bought all the mushrooms. I was like, oh, I didn't realize you were looking for mushrooms. And then I looked at Mushroom Steve, and it was like, oh, you sold all those to one person? He's like, hey, first come, first serve, man. And then he left. He bought a couple beers. I'm sorry, this guy was dirty, man. Like, dirty as fuck. Like, just like black hands, black arms, black fingernails, everything. It was kind of, I mean, kind of disgusting. When I met him, I shook his hand. Um, So it wasn't that disgusting. It just looked like, looked like a dude who had just come in from, like, a sweep in a chimney or something. And uh, so he bought a couple beers, then left, and then came back. And uh, he's like, "Ah, I'm going to go take a shower. And then I was talking to someone else later. And they were like, I was like, yeah, the dude Mushroom Steve sold 20 pounds of morel to one woman that he had har- spent all day harvesting. They're like, ah, yo, Mushroom Steve. And one of them said something along the lines of like, hey, if you got enough money, <laughs> the Mushroom Steve will sell you 20 pounds of anything. And uh, I learned that, then I learned that Mushroom Steve is, spends a lot of time in the Cascade Jail and just kind of a bit of a drifter. And it made a lot of sense. And, um... When he came back, he had showered, and he was, like, moderately clean after he showered, and I chatted with him for a while, asking about, like, where you get the mushrooms? Is that up on Thunder Mountain Road, which I had, you know, had another interaction up there the first time I was riding up there, just with some guy, stopped to see if I was okay, I'd gotten off my bike just to scope the sign and, like, what the area was like, and and he was like, oh, I'm headed up Mush Thunder Mountain Road to check, out, check for morels, and I was like, oh, okay. So the Steve was like, yeah, man, like, He's like, you got to fucking, you go find the burned out area of the forest. Then you go deep back in there. And that's where you find them. They grow in the burned out areas. And I was like, oh, that makes sense why you were so dirty and covered with soot. And he's like, sometimes, sometimes you find them right away. Sometimes it takes forever. And uh, he had said like the first 10 pounds he found like very quickly. And then it took like four or five hours to go find the next 10 pounds. But, you know, sells that shit for a lot of fucking money, man. And then basically blew most of it on food and ordered a pizza and was buying beers for everybody. And uh, I got to say, Saturday night was fucking wild because it was the 3rd of July and everybody was up there raging and I was just talking to a lot of people. People kept asking Loren, like, where'd you find this guy? You know, who's this guy? Like, they wouldn't ask me to my face. They would ask her even though she was just sitting at the end of the bar. And well within earshot of me. Like, I'd be, I'd introduce myself. Hey, what can I get you? And they'd just turn and look and say to Muriel, Where, where'd you find this guy? Who's this? And she just kept saying over and over, uh, I don't know. He just he just rode his motorcycle into town last week and, and asked if I needed help. And I said yes. And uh, throughout the course of the night, I, I became friendly with everybody. Um, and I realized... Yeah, I've never attended bar before, in case you were wondering. Like, I was never a bartender at Wetlands. I was never a bartender back in the day. I had, like, I did do one shift at Wetlands bartending um, down in the lounge one night just so I could say I had a shift bartending. But I, uh, in that shift, I, I remember I was like, I'm, you you could only get beers in Jack and Cokes. Um, if you want anything else, you got to go upstairs. So I didn't really give a fuck. I just wanted to, like, have fun. A bunch of my friends came, and I was getting them really drunk. But uh, but never really been a bartender. My friend Noah Chernin got a bartending gig later in life, not as late as me, obviously, but when he was in his like late twenties, um, he started bartending at the Mercury Lounge, and that was pretty funny because I well, first time I went in there and he was working, I was like, "What are you doing bartending? You know how to bartend?" And he was like, "Hey, how hard could it be?" He had been bar backing at the Bowery Ballroom. He's like, "How hard could it be?" And I was like, it "Could be pretty hard, man." And he's like, "No." He's like, "I learned two things. One." I just tell people, if it's not named after what's in it, I don't make it for you. You want a Jack and Coke? You want a vodka soda? You want a gin and tonic? Fine. You want a Cape Cod? I don't know what that is. Go down the street. Someone else will make you a Cape Cod. You know, it's a fucking rock club. You get beer or a Jack and Coke, whatever. And then, I was like, how do you know how much to pour? And he just pulled a bottle of Jack out and pulled the thing of Coke, the little soda gun, and then tipped the Jack upside down, put some ice in a cup, tipped the Jack upside down, hit coke on the soda gun and then just let them both go until the cup was full and he's like there you go that's how you know the perfect ratio (laughs) i was like man i love this that's fucking great and uh right then that's when i learned that that's everything you need to know about bartending right 
like to be a bartender at a regular place. You want to be a bartender at a hotel bar where some fucking asshole businessman's going to come in and tell you he wants a Harvey Wallbanger or a Cosmopolitan or whatever the fuck. No, thank you. But uh, you want to work at a, you know, a real salt of the earth kind of bar. I don't think you need to know that much. And uh, turns out you didn't. And the skills you do need to be a bartender, I have innately, which is making people feel comfortable, coming up with mindless chit-chat, witty quips, um, banter, interactions. I had that in spades, and throughout the night, people kept complimenting me. They were tipping me well, learned a lot about human nature. You could tell certain people were tipping to let you know that they could. You know what I mean? I'm a man. I can give you fucking $8. And I was like, great, man. Great. Just keep showing me that you're a man, you know? And... um. Yeah, it, it served a bunch of cool purposes. Like, most importantly, I think, obviously, making some money is nice, but also um, it filled this void of socialization and social interactivity that I that I wasn't sure that I was having. I mean, I kind of knew, but without being socialized and socializing, I wasn't sure that I was missing it, you know? Because I haven't really been missing it, or I didn't think so. And then up there, I was like, oh, this is great. After the first night, I was like, cool. Second night. So, anyway, oh, it was like I was there from two to like eight, and Loren told me we closed at nine, and I was like, okay. But then she was like, there's going to be karaoke starting around 8.30. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. She's like, yeah, family's going to come in, and one of the guys from the family, he, he brings the karaoke rig, and he'll host it. So, like, won't be anything special. No, karaoke went fucking off like it started very slow that shit went on from 8 30 until 1 in the morning and we ended up serving the 1 30 like you know i guess you don't call last call in a place like this it's just like pe- you just, people stay open as long as people are drinking and Lauren told me it's one of the latest she's ever been open but uh people were drinking and partying and people were getting fucked up and like everyone's putting things on other people's tabs and you know it's not the kind of place where you like take a credit card for the tab it's just like there's this guy Cecil who was standing outside all night and like I don't know 10 different people just came inside at different points of the night and like hey put that I want a you know I want a Rainier I want a Monaco never heard of a Monaco before it's some sort of one of those drinks kind of like a White Claw but it's it's like the tequila version of White Claw so people were drinking a lot of Monacos people were like just yeah give me two Monacos put it on Cecil's tab and at one point I said to Lorraine how do I know if it's okay to put this on this guy's tab or whatever and uh, she's just like if they say to put it on that person's tab, put it on that person's tab. But I was like, okay. She's like, it's, that's that's that kind of town, you know? And I was like, all right. So Cecil had the most wildest tab with the most different things on it. You know, like probably one of everything they sell there was on Cecil's tab by the end of the night. But he came in, fucking staggered in at like 20 past one and paid his bill. And uh, just like so many different tabs going. And, and I fell right in the swing of it. I felt very like at home and natural behind the bar. And um. Uh, I guess I can't say I'm like, surprised by it, but it was pretty cool. And, I mean, shit just was raging all night. It was a lot of hand. And there was a, a couple of people I met who they had moved from Seattle to Roslyn, Washington. A couple named Amy and Derek who were mad cool. And they came in. They were doing the BDR, which is the Backcountry Discovery Route, which is those maps I've talked about a lot on here called the Butler Maps. Butler partnered with a – there's a group of motorcycle enthusiasts that come – that have come up with something called the BDR, Backcountry Discovery Route. And they have them for all the states in the West, basically. And it teaches you how to get from the northern, to traverse a state from the southern point to the northern point, all on dirt roads. And they kind of tell you how to do it in sections. And you, you have to do a little bit of pavement sometimes to get to places with gas stations and food and stuff. Um, but Butler Maps makes a BDR map also. Um, and... You, so you can buy the map or you can just find the waypoints, go online and figure it out. And uh, the backcountry discovery route, one of the stops is Yellow Pine. So you get you get a fair amount of like motorcycle adventurists who come through town too. Not like a ton. I thought I thought I I honestly thought it would be more, but maybe it's Fourth of July weekend, so maybe it wasn't so popular. We'll see how it goes next weekend. A handful of them, but like less than ten. Um, I'd be curious to see how popular the like Idaho BDR r- route is. I think though, I think most people don't understand the joy of riding motorcycles on dirt roads and think that like something bad could happen. So like I think the majority of people who 
ride motorcycles, still stay mainly to paved roads. Um, so I'll be curious to see how that goes. But this this couple, Amy and Derek, they were in a pickup truck with a camper on the back, I think they said, and mountain bikes. And they were doing the whole BDR. And um, they came back for the karaoke, and it was, it was pretty fun. Derek sang. Um, I forget what song, but... But it was just a, there was a cool crew, like cool crew of people. This other woman named Jessie showed up. She was doing the BDR alone. Her husband's a pilot for a private jet company and works one week on, one week off. So she like they ride, they do a bunch of different BDR routes. And when she, they do it all summer. They had ridden out from Milwaukee and through the Black Hills. And she was telling me that she like, like she her and her husband will ride together for a week, and then Hale go to his private jet pilot job and then while he's away for a week she'll do all sorts of other routes dirt roads and shit and then meet up back with him when he gets back for his week off of work i didn't even ask her what she does for work maybe she's a school teacher or something something she had the summer off be motorcycling around um but see that's the beauty like i didn't ask her what she did for work i didn't ask almost anybody what they did for work and nobody asked me and most people in McCall haven't asked me. Some have asked me. Um, but up there, pretty much nobody asked me. Loren asked me, actually, yesterday. Was like, so what is it that you did in New York, like, work-wise? And I said, yeah, I just concert. I worked on organizing concerts. That's it. I just left it at that. And that's the way I want to leave it. And, like, another guy, this guy, Stu, who would, uh, owns a couple pieces of property up there. I don't even know what he does. Um... Like, like I said, I don't know what anyone does. I don't give a fuck. I don't want to know because I don't want to tell them either. Like, it's that's such a fucking breath of fresh air. It's just like, let's just talk about literally anything except work and politics, right? Um, work, politics, and money, obviously. Money and work kind of go hand in hand because usually the only time you ask someone what they do for work is you're trying to gauge how much money they make or, you know, not usually, but a lot of the time. I mean, that's probably the subtext of that question uh, oftentimes. But yeah, it was just a wild cast of characters. Everyone was fucking tanked by the end of the night. I was seeing double um, just because I was so tired. I was not expecting, you know, I was not expecting to be the uh, 12 hour shift, you know. Um, and by the time it was over, I was like fucking, oh, my God, I could barely even see straight. And then I went out to my campsite, rode back to my campsite, slept and then came in and did it all again yesterday on Sunday. And uh Got in there at like 1.30 and Loren was like, hey, good to see you again. You know, you did great last night. And then throughout the day, more people came in and, and people kept telling me like, oh, my God, you were great last night. We're psyched to have you here. Everyone else said you were great. Like all these customers were saying great things and about how they liked me. And at one point I threatened a customer because she was pretty sauced and she... I felt like she was lying to me about wanting to start a tab because she said, I don't want to put a bunch of different charges on my card. And I was like, okay, well, we'll just start a tab and you can pay all at once. And then she was like, I think she was kind of drunk because then she was like, Loren, I want to open a tab. He's not sure if it let me open a tab. And Loren was like, why do you need to open a tab? Why don't you just pay for it? And she's like, I left my card back at the house. And I was like, wait a minute, she's lying. So then I said to her, there was all these horse collars up on the wall. And then I was like, you better pay your tab. Like, you better not take off. And then she she said something like, I'll be back Tuesday. Wait, no, Monday. No, Tuesday. Before I leave town. No, Monday. Well, trust me, I'm not going to take off without paying this tab. So then I said, okay, well, I'm just going to let you know. If you take off without paying the tab, I'm going to track you down with one of those horse collars. I'm going to put it on you, and I'm going to drag you all the way back to McCall. We're going to lock you right, in the, right on the dirt road in front of the... In front of the tavern, everybody's going to know that Tracy Sanchez didn't pay her tab. And she was like, wait, what? She, I'm going to pay. And then she stormed off. And I turned to Loren and I was like, Loren, is it okay that I threaten the customers like that? And she was like, yes, absolutely. Some of them need threatening. And I was like, okay. Um, so I was like, all right, I think I'm going to fit in here just fine. And, you know, I just kept, yeah, shooting the shit with everybody and always having a witty remark. And I got to say, like, that's kind of the socialization that I miss I miss that more than I miss my actual friends. And that's probably going to be a big topic for me in therapy this week because a lot of my social anxiety um, that I've suffered over the years, like I've talked about it on this podcast, but like the idea of like going to someone's birthday party where I know a few people, but everybody knows that person and that's how we're all connected. That to me is horrifying. Going to someone's wedding is horrifying. I only know a handful of people. I don't mind being in groups where I know everybody, 
And I don't mind being in huge groups at concerts that I'm promoting um, because I always have an out and like, oh, hey, sorry, I'm working. I got to go check on the band or I got to go do this or I got to go do that. I got to go make sure the captain of the boat's not drunk, you know, um, there's always an out so I can have nice brief interactions with people and then split. And that's kind of what bartending is. You just have a ton of brief interactions. And then if someone's interesting, you go over when you don't have a customer and chat with them a little more. And then you just, you know, you keep looking away and I, you know, you can always, oh, I got to go check on so-and-so's burger. Hey, I'll be right back. But y'all, you're in control of how much interaction you have with that person. And my favorite thing over the years of at Rocks Off and even before, I, when I worked the door for a while at Wetlands and at Coney Island High, I loved working the door and taking people's money as they came in because I loved having a 10, 15 second interaction with a customer and asking them, hey, what band are you here to see tonight? What brings you to Wetlands? What brings you to Coney Island? Hey, how's it going? Hey, nice t-shirt, whatever, you know, a little flirty with the girls, bro, bro with the guys, you know, and uh I love doing that on the boat cruises too. And like doing the will call. That was always my favorite was like checking everyone on the way in because I, what I loved about that too was obviously like for a long time, that was great with girls doing the will call on the boats. Cause girls come in, you see who's with a guy who's not, uh, you have little interactions. Then they would, they would remember you from being the guy that checked them in and you're kind of safe because you're not just approaching them completely cold if you go up to them at the show. And so I met a lot of chicks that way, both like chicks that I, you know, became friends with, chicks that I banged that night, chicks that I dated for a little while afterwards, like all sorts of different chicks. I met dudes that way too, like just a cool way to meet people. But also, once again, you're you're sort of in charge of that interaction. And then you can be like, okay, go, you got to get on the way. It's like as someone behind you, you know? Um so I definitely like felt that with bartending and I liked it and I'd never done it before as a way to earn money. Um, and I think I probably got tipped pretty well. I guess I'll find out as it, as it moves forward, but like, I'm pretty sure I got tipped more than your average person in that role would have gotten tipped because people sit down to eat. I'm taking their food orders, Loran's order doing the food, but like, you know, just, just being very chit chatty and friendly and like, Oh, what brings you to yellow pine? You know, talking to the kids, Hey kid, like, Oh, you must be a cool dude. Cause only cool dudes like pizza. And you just said you wanted pizza, you know, shit like that. Um, and yeah, doing it for money is kind of cool. And, uh, so yeah, I'm going to do more of it. Um, I think I'm going to go back up there this weekend and work a little bit and see what happens. And, you know, Loren was like, you're welcome here anytime. So she's, you know, we, I agreed to come back up there this weekend and, uh, we'll see how it goes, but I'm pretty stoked. And it definitely seems like the kind of place where I could see myself like living and then coming back to New York when I have clusters of shows and, you know, I could see myself spending a lot of the all next summer in New York because it's going to be our 20th anniversary of the Rocks Off Cruise season. So, I think there's a pretty good chance I'm going to have a ton of shows going on. I'll need to be there for big stretches. And who knows, maybe I'll even ride my motorcycle out to New York. And then when I'm not working in New York, maybe I'll motorcycle around the Northeast. I don't know. Or maybe I'll just want to fly back to Idaho. Maybe I'll have bought the Yellow Pine Tavern by then. It's hard to say. Uh, the world is my oyster, though. And I feel that a little a little now more, more than I have lately. Um, the weekend has been, I think, pretty important to remind myself that, like... I don't want to be isolated and away from people, but I want to be away from people, if that makes sense. I don't want to be, I don't want to live like a fucking complete hermit in the woods, but I certainly am more interested in living in Yellow Pine if I knew I could work one or two days a week at the tavern in perpetuity, sort of, you know what I mean? Just to get out and socialize that way. Um, and now I kind of learned that I am a really good bartender. And Loren was even like, she was like, you handled that incredibly well. You were keeping track of everybody's drinks, asking them if they needed more, knowing who was drinking what, people are coming up to the bar. It's like, ah, another, you know, another Keystone Light for you, Ray, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, I think all that shit goes a long way with being a good bartender. So it's very, definitely very interesting to learn that like I could probably make a living at that if I needed to. And that's the kind of job where you can do anywhere you want. Um, I never thought it would be something. I thought about it when I first got up here to McCall. Like, maybe I could get a job as a bartender, but COVID and all that. But I was also like, I don't want to be around drunk people. And then I realized I love being around drunk people um, to a point when I can get away from them. And also, like, it's a lot of fun fucking with drunk people. You know what I mean? And, like, 
they're coming up and they think they're being funny and smart and you just toss a joke out at them and, and half the time they don't get it, which is funny to me. And then the other half, they like, it takes a second to register and they're like, ah, that's funny. You're making fun of me. And you're like, well, yeah, because you're fucking drunk and you're acting stupid and it's very easy to make fun of you and it's kind of cool. So, so yeah, that's been really interesting. Um, yeah, and... You know, like I said, man, the fucking ride out there. Like, what a commute. You know what I mean? So it looks like for a little while, I'll go out there and work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, nights, and then maybe Sunday morning help with the breakfast rush because I'm going to wake up in Yellow Pine anyway because you can't make that ride in the dark. There's no street lights or anything, um, and it's a dangerous road. So I would never do that in the dark. Um, so if I'm going to stay over Saturday night, maybe I'll do the morning shift on Sunday. Um, and just help out with the breakfast rush or whatever, and then ride back. And that seems like a pretty good gig for the summer. And I think by the end of the summer, I'll certainly like know if I really do like being in a place like Yellow Pine. Um, but you know, like there's nothing hip about it, man. And I don't think it's going to get hip and I don't want it to become hip. And there's places in America that need, just need to stay small town places in America. Not everybody has to be current, like, there is a TV behind the bar, but there's also a broken satellite dish. Um, now, that's something I would ask Loren. Like, hey, man, can, Loren, can I, can we put this TV in the back, like, in the back room? Like, why do we have a TV out here if there's no satellite dish for it? We're not having a movie night, you know? Like, shouldn't be screens and bars, unless it's, like, a dedicated sports bar or something. Um, but, like, I got to play some music, too, which Saturday I just kept, like, there was a five CD changer. It had the Eagles and I don't know. I don't, God, God, I honestly don't know who else. Other, some other country shit um, that I just kept like every time it would run out of the five CDs, I would press play again. So I had to do that a few times because it was such a long shift. Um, but uh, then Sunday, I, was, I looked through a bunch of the cassettes and CDs that they had there. They didn't have a cable for me to plug my phone into, which is probably safe. But I pulled out this Marty Robbins cassette, and I just pulled it out of the case and put it in. And it turned out it was an Otis Redding album. And then I was like, holy shit, yeah, this is way better than the Eagles. Hey, the Eagles is good, too, of course. Kind of, right? Uh, but, uh, I mean, Otis Redding's fucking Otis Redding, right? And a couple people came in and they're like, oh, cool music. And then I was like, boom, okay, now I got this. I'm going to buy a cable to hook my iPod or my phone up to the stereo system. I'm going to start putting playlists together. and I'm going to really rock that the fuck out. And it's also, they have speakers outside, too. They have three speakers outside. So it's like, if you're walking up and down Main Street, that's what you hear. So in some little way, I guess I, I guess, I guess I will have, I'll become like the town DJ. And I guess I'll be a little like Chris Stevens from Northern Exposure. That's just dawning on me, which is pretty damn cool. You know, inject, inject a little culture, nothing hip, but a little, a little culture, just play some different music up there in that bar because they only had like a dozen CDs and a dozen tapes. So I think people have just been listening to the same shit over and over and over for all the years there. Um, so it'd be very cool to figure out, try to figure out like, what do these people want to hear? Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go too far off the reservation. I'm not going to start playing Tribe Called Quest up there. You know, I actually, maybe, um, but you know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to like, I want to make sure people are having a good time, right? That's what being a good bartender is, but also like push them a little bit. But what I was kind of getting at was like, yeah, I don't want, I don't want that place to become hip at all. Like the only businesses in town, there's the lodge, there's the corner restaurant, there's the tavern, the general store, and there's a hunting outfitter. And the hunting outfitter will take you on hunting trips, like specifically to get a bear or a mountain lion um, or an elk or a deer or something. And you pay X amount and for X amount of days to try to track down one of these creatures, which, you know, I don't I don't know that that's the coolest thing in the world. Um, especially not like if you're doing it to pose with the animal or something. Um, but I, I don't know enough about that to really comment on that either. Like, I don't know. Mountain lions are good. They're bad. If they bred too many, do they need to be killed? Do you need to control the population? I'm not a forester. Um, which brings me to, I really been digging into the big burn the past few days, which is a book about the creation of the American, the United States national forest service. And, uh, how Teddy Roosevelt was instrumental in, he was the guy who set aside all this land for the National Forest Service and created most of the national parks. Um, 
And so I'm reading about that, which is very fascinating. And obviously, at the, the, the interesting timing being up in Yellow Pine, which is in the heart of a national forest. And also the, the gist of the book is supposed to be about the big fire that happened out west in 1910. And um, they say forest fires come every 30 years or so to different areas and really, really like reset the vegetation sort of of that area. I'm still trying to learn more, so I can't say too much about that. But uh, the last major fire up in Yellow Pine was 2007. And Lorraine said she took off for a few years because it was too depressing to drive up there through the burnt out forest to get to the town. The town didn't burn, but like the roads to get to it did. Um, so it was pretty rough. But they say if they're every 30 years, then that would mean they'll be due for another one in 2037. So 15 years we're right in the middle of it. Probably a good time to get in there. But also like shit sideways, bro. Like I was saying earlier, you know, coming back to shit being sideways is like... There could be fucking devastating, wild, crazy forest fires up here this year. Like there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't nearly the amount of precipitation that there used to be or that there had been in years past. I was told like we didn't get as much snow. We didn't get as many rain days uh, just in this whole general area. So that means everything's a little drier than it should be. And, um, you know, a lot of forest fires obviously start from arson and people be like arson and or people being stupid, flicking cigarette butts out the window you know, like not containing their campfires and shit like that. But a lot of them are just, I learned that the worst storms, I learned when I was working out on that farm last week, a storm was coming in and uh, I learned that the ones without rain are the worst because those are the ones most most likely to produce lightning, which is going to spark a wildfire. And that most wildfires are sparked by lightning and that's why they're called wildfires. Um, lightning will crack in a tree, throw off some sparks light some leaves and it'll just burn and that's what nature has done over the years right before there was firefighters and a u.s forest service um but yeah i hope these places don't get wiped out man you know i hope uh you know oregon washington california idaho we're just on the other side of oregon you know and i did learn that idaho the top of idaho the top of the panhandle of idaho is like 45 miles wide and the base of idaho is 450 miles wide it's the only state that's got that odd of a shape um, I guess Georgia does too, but only in the very lower right, right? And and Alabama, the very lower left. Um, and Mississippi, lower right. But like most states are relatively square or long like California, but they're all kind of like, you know, square or rectangle-ish. California's kind of like a rectangle, just laid on its side. But uh, yeah, Idaho is a really weird shape. So we're kind of, you know, we're buried right between the Oregon, Washington, and Montana. And um, there's a lot of fire, forest fires up here in this area. This is, this could be trouble. So I'm hoping there won't be. I'm hoping Yellow Pine's going to survive this year, next year, and past, past all that. And uh, hopefully by the time I buy my cabin in Yellow Pine, I will be able to insure it against forest fires. I hear that's pretty hard to do in, in a lot of areas in the U.S. now. I know in McCall right now, if you, it's, it's hard if, there's only a couple places that'll insure you and they're charging a fortune. Um, if you already have insurance, you're grandfathered in, but if you buy a new house, then you're, or you're building a new house and you're trying to get insurance against forest fires, it's really tricky. Um, and I'm sure that's only going to get worse and worse because kids, we know insurance companies don't give a fuck about you. Their whole job is to take your money willingly, forcibly take your money um, you know, you can't have a mortgage without having insurance against fire and stuff like that. So they forcibly take your money and then they do everything they can and not pay it out, whether it's health insurance, fire insurance, car insurance, you know, like you always find out like, oh, insurance isn't covering this, insurance isn't covering that, which is bullshit. So anyway, let's hope that their uh, United States homeowners, landowners aren't in need of insurance this year. So hopefully, you know, will the good Lord smile down upon us this year, fire season? I don't know. But I'll let you know. Hope I don't get trapped up in Yellow Pine in the middle of a fire, right? That'd be just my luck. I bet I'd find a way out of it, though. Apparently, one of the biggest heroes in the fire of 1910 was a guy named Ed Pulaski. Um, saved hundreds of lives, they say, but perished himself. And if I'm going to perish in a forest fire, it's going to be while saving a bunch of other people. Uh, maybe that's my lot in life. If so, that wouldn't be so bad. Um, but I'm hoping I'm saving you this week. I hope that I've saved you from some boredom, from some tedium. I hope that I've saved you from, um, 
maybe a little something in your own head that was telling you that you were going to wait for something to happen, right? And like you had something that you would like to see happen, but you didn't know how to attack it. You just got to go do it, man. Whatever your yellow pine is, get on whatever your motorcycle is and ride that distant 52 mile dirt road to get there and then just ask for what you want. Present to the universe or more specifically to the people in control of you getting what you want. If you want a job, go tell them you want a job and don't put a resume on monster.com hoping you get a job at an ad agency. Go to the ad agency. Make up an advertisement about the ad agency. Think to yourself, like, if, if I was an ad agency and I wanted to advertise to try to find new clients, how would I do that? Come up with a pitch. You know, whatever it is you want. Like, go out there and make it happen. Don't wait for people to do things for you or people to notice you. Make yourself noticed. Whatever aspect of life that is you're trying to get through, whether it's romantic, whether it's professional, whether it's personal, like... Life is there for the taking, and life won't wait. If you don't reach out and take it, somebody else will, or it's just going to move along and make itself out of your reach if you wait long enough, you know? So I don't want to see that happen to anybody I love. I don't want to see that happen to anybody at all. I want everybody to prosper. I'm like Joel Osteen of the Solo Podcast crew without the Jesus. I preach prosperity podcasting here. That's about it. That's going to do it for our time here on Tuesdays with Jakey for Tuesday, July 6th. This is just a reminder that Tuesday, August 3rd, I'm going to be discussing Ishmael, the book by Daniel Quinn. So go out and get your copy. I'm going to discuss it on the August 3rd episode. And then we're going to have a Zoom, maybe that weekend, the following week at some point. We're going to have a Zoom call so everybody can come on there and discuss that book. And uh, if it goes well, we'll do more of it. If it doesn't go well, well... Hey, fuck it, you know? Might just be me zooming one person. Hey, Stucky, you like to read? Yo, Aaron Lazar, Mr. Giraffe, I know you like to read. I think you should get a copy of Ishmael. Uh, Eddie Deneen, I know you're out there. You keep bugging me to read this other book you sent me. I think you should get a copy of Ishmael. Antonio, let's get Ishmael. Adam Hertz, Ishmael will teach you about your life. Robbie Pallada. Greg Gaiello, who else is out there listening? I feel like I'm doing the end of Zoom back in the day of the Rumpa Room, where they'd say, and Sarah, and Arwen, and Greg, and Eva, and everybody else who's listening to this podcast. I think you should go out and get a copy of Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Let's all become friends. You know, friends through reading. Reading isn't just fundamental. Reading is fun. Peace.